Well, yeah, I mean, I guess if you guys are gonna keep subscribing to my channel, I'm gonna have to put up a video more than once a month. So, here it is. A young man, really a boy, is being convicted of murder, specifically murdering his father. The men on the jury who are charged with the task of deciding his guilt or his innocence go into the jury room to make that decision, and 11 of them go in there convinced that he is guilty. But one of them, juror number eight, played by Henry Fonda, isn't quite as sure. And over the course of the hours that they spend in that tiny jury room, he manages to convince the other 11 jurors that there is reasonable doubt in the boy's case. Without any further ado, let's take a look at 12 Angry Men and find out what's all the fuss about. Do you follow me? Uh, not guilty. Why is the run go? All those voting guilty, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, that's eleven guilty. All those voting not guilty. One, right. Eleven guilty, one not guilty. Well, now we know where we are. Oh boy, oh boy, there's always one. <laughs> but I think what's important to understand about 12 Angry Men is that it's not meant to be taken as a literal event. It's not meant to be, this is something that could really happen. It's not meant to convey real life. It's meant to be, in many ways, a suspension from reality. Think about a lot of the aspects of the film. First of all, it is very simplistic in its direction. It all takes place, for the most part, in this one little room. It takes place with just these 12 actors throwing these ideas, throwing these lines against each other. There's no action, there's no romance, there's no sort of titillation in that way. It's just these 12 men stating ideas. I mean, there's a lot of passion in the movie, don't get me wrong, but it's not the sort of traditional Hollywood movie that we expect audiences to sit still for. Not only that, but none of these jurors actually have names. I mean, we do learn the names of Juror 8 and Juror 9 at the end of the film, and I actually, that's actually one of the few aspects of this film that I really don't like, but we really don't learn any of these guys' names. They are known by their juror numbers. 1, 2, 3, 1 through 12. And so they're not really so much people as they are personalities. Now they're very distinct personalities and they do have lives outside of the jury room. We get that sense for sure. And the details of the trial are such that we are able to associate it with real life. But because all the jurors are anonymous and because the setting is kind of by its very nature, set apart from the real world, and because the details of the case, even though they're there, they're still pretty generic, they're still pretty vague in a lot of ways, we can see how this could be a suspension from reality. It's a thought experiment. It's almost like these 12 different personalities could be 12 different perspectives going on in the same brain. The conflict in this film is kind of twofold. The who, the guy who is traditionally thought of as the antagonist to juror number eight is juror number three. He's the last one to change his vote to not guilty. He's basically the loudest opponent to juror eight. He's kind of the ringleader of all of these other guys who are voting guilty. But if you think about it, his argument doesn't really hold up. It's purely based on emotion. It's purely based on just kind of this stubborn hatred, unreasonable hatred that he has for this boy because of, you know, associations he makes with his own family and whatnot. But at the same time, another person that Juror 8 has to go up against is Juror Number 4. Juror Number 4, even though he is voting the same way as Juror Number 3, is the opposite of him in a lot of ways because his decision comes from pure logic. And I love that each of the jurors comes to their conclusion to vote not guilty for a different reason. And some of those reasons aren't necessarily good reasons. Like, Juror 7 changes his vote because he wants to get out of there, because he doesn't really care whether the kid's guilty or not. He just wants to get out of there, and so when he senses the tide is turning, he says, okay, I'm going to change my vote to not guilty to get us out of here faster. Unless you think that this is all one-sided, they do raise the question of, okay, what if we say that this boy is not guilty, and he goes out and kills again? It turns out he is guilty, and we're just perpetuating the problem. That question is asked, and though it isn't answered, it is a little bit of an unsettling point. Like, our just 
justice system allows for reasonable doubt. Our justice system says that you are innocent until definitively proven guilty. But sometimes, either from lack of evidence or just from lousy prosecution, you can't be definitively proven guilty even if you are guilty. And so it is possible under that system for someone to be released who is guilty. But I think the question that the movie is ultimately trying to ask is which would be worse, to release a criminal back into the world who really is guilty or to incarcerate someone who is actually innocent and possibly also put him to death. And whether you agree or disagree with that assessment, it's still a fascinating look at this idea, at this concept, and it really has taken hold of our collective consciousness in a lot of ways. So what's all the fuss about? I think I pretty much just said it. This movie is such an interesting idea and so interestingly executed. One of the things I love about this movie is that you have 12 very distinct personalities in that jury room, but none of them is really raised above any of the others. They're all distinct personality, they all get a chance to state their opinions, they all get a chance to make themselves known in some way. They are all important to this story. And I love that, and I love the simplicity, and I love the discussion, I love the dialogue that comes out of it. I love the passion of these characters. This is not an easy movie to make interesting. It is pretty much all dialogue, but the passion of these characters and the passion of their arguments and their ideas is so compelling that you don't even notice that you are watching a movie completely composed of dialogue. And there are a lot of great visual things and a lot of great cinematic things in this movie as well. It's not just the dialogue that drives the story. The story is still very, very visual, which it has to be if it's going to be a good movie, I think. There's just so much involved with this movie, I could keep talking on and on and on about it, but I think I've talked long enough. I think I've covered all the major points that I want to cover in this, and so I'm going to cut it off here. To sum up, 12 Angry Men is an excellent film. It is a wonderful film. I don't think you will ever encounter another film quite like this one, unless it is directly copying the idea of 12 Angry Men. It's fascinating, it's well put together, it's well executed, the characters are compelling, the things that they are discussing are very compelling. It's just a great film all around. If you haven't seen it yet, I implore you to go see it. In fact, I implore you so ardently that if you haven't been able to figure it out by now, this movie gets an ultimate recommendation. This one goes on the list of the few that I would recommend to absolutely everyone. And the next movie that I'm going to be reviewing on the AFI list is number 86 on the list, Platoon. See you then.